Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to, I believe, the final session of today's uh, conference. Well done for making it this far. Um, we've got two wonderful presentations um, for you uh, in this session. Um, I'm not going to say much more other than to invite you all to um, put as many questions and comments uh, as you can into the, uh, into the chat function, into the Q&A, and I'll try and pick up as many of these as uh, I possibly can. Um, and just so introduce myself, I'm Simon Roberts um, and uh, I'm an anthropologist. Um, but first up today, um, we're delighted to have Professor Vibar Cregan Reed um, speak uh, to you, um, drawing mainly on some ideas from his uh, new book, Primate Change, How the World We Made is Remaking Us. So with um, not much further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to Vibar. Thank you very much indeed, Simon. Um, thanks very much as well for the uh, invitation uh, by ILC to talk to you today. Um, as Simon said, I'm going to be talking to you about a few ideas in, 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 um, uh, from climate change. Um, I could easily talk about this for several hours, but I'm going to try and, and, and keep it short. So I wrote this book um, and also um, milked it for a couple of um, uh, BBC uh, series that you can track down on BBC Sounds. It's called uh, Changing uh, World, Changing Bodies. And the, the, the theme of the book is all there in the subtitle, really. It's about um, the fact that we live in a world um, that we have made, but that our bodies are not made for, uh, for this world. So... Uh, Modern life is modern life is 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 great. Um, you know we are uh, much healthier than we've ever been, or so we believe. We're certainly more comfortable. We have you know we have nicer nicer chairs to sit in. Uh, we believe that we live longer, and healthcare is certainly uh, a whole lot better than it has been in the past for humans. Um, and I'd say that the most extreme statistic is the fact that um, infant mortality in um, modern economies now is, is down well below 1%, where in some hunter-gathering communities, it was as high as, as 40. So modern life has delivered a great deal of good for us, but me being an academic, I don't really want to focus on the good things, I want to focus on the things that are going, that are going wrong for us. Um, so we think, we believe that we're doing very, very well, but actually, um, once you start to kind of look a bit closer, uh, the human body um, and the aging human body in particular isn't actually doing all that well. You know, if modern life was so great, then uh, why is it that 70% uh, of people in the US are on uh, prescription medication? Now that's so many pills that if you put them together, they'll go all the way around the earth twice and actually they'll do an additional Atlantic uh, crossing. In the UK, we, uh, we, fare a, we fare a little better, but not all that much better where we have 50% of us are on regular prescription medication. So um, when I started working on this project a few years ago, about three years ago, I thought I'd find one or two illnesses here and there that were uh, caused by lifestyle. Uh, but what I discovered was something um, uh, much greater, that uh, the environment is actually an incredibly powerful um, predictor and shaper of the human body. So we all know that we're living longer now, but actually, um, um, you know, things like longevity, um, for a long time it's been assumed that um, uh, having the right genes will mean that you get to live a long time like the Sardinians. So we actually went to Sardinia and, and made a programme about longevity for the World Service. Um, uh, but where we spoke to um, experts there and they told us that actually up to 90% of longevity is predicted not by genetics but by lifestyle. Another very common one, one that I suffer from quite badly, is allergies. Allergies are so new for the modern body. They are so new for the modern body that the word itself wasn't invented until the 20th century. So there's no precise figure for this, but it looks like allergies might, be, might have a, a kind of 99% um, environmental predictor with about a 1% genetic factor. So 
and the genetics are tiny and the rest is driven by lifestyle. So these are some of the illnesses that are that have a strong environmental predictor. I was going to read them out, but you know, um, well, there's just too many. Um, so our life expectancy is good. Uh, these are some of the illnesses, as I said, sorry, that, are, uh, that have strong environmental uh, factors. So our life expectancy is good, but it's not as good as we think it is because the mathematical models that we actually use to measure longevity um, are kind of uh, warp the figures. Um, so hunter-gathering communities, the research that's been done on um, some um, hunter-gathering groups in lowland Ecuador show that the uh, Zimane tribe, um, their life expectancy, um, they only lose out on about two to four years of life expectancy when compared to people in the US, for example. And these are, these are people that have no access to healthcare. So why, why would this be? And how did we get into this mess where we are riven by so many of these diseases? This, by the way, is a very small sample of what's called mismatch diseases, where uh, it's about diseases that are generated by a mismatch between our body and our environment. Now, to give you some sense of what's happening with the modern body, um, this is a, a, a graph which I'll um, explain. It's, um, it shows the kind of the age of our DNA. Now, the big blue bar at the bottom is um, uh, the age of Homo habilis, kind of basically human DNA. And that's been around for about 2 million years. Homo sapiens, we're still not sure exactly how long Homo sapiens have been around for, but they've, uh, at the moment we know that they've been around for about three, three, um, 300,000 years. And if we start to look at the fractions of time that we're, that we're interested in, if you go up um, to the top, uh, I, I can assure you there is actually data in this graph, but the data is so tiny that it doesn't even appear as a single pixel. So the Industrial Revolution, in comparison with the age of our DNA, is such a small and tiny span of time that it doesn't even occupy a single pixel on the screen. And although uh, as humans have cycled through various revolutions, um, uh, we have started to, to, to gather um, mismatch diseases or even just conditions like short-sightedness and things, it's really in the industrial revolution that we see it accelerate. And this is because um, I think as, a, as, as humans, we tend to think of history in, in relationship, you know, in relationship to our own lifespan, which is the longest thing that we can realistically imagine. And the Industrial Revolution seems like a long time at, at several lifespans. But once you start to look at the age of our DNA, it becomes minuscule, it becomes absolutely tiny. And if we looked at... Um, uh, the age of mammalian DNA, then the graph would become just hilarious because mammalian DNA, you know, our DNA is mammalian DNA and our DNA has been around for about, about 70 million years. Um, so the Industrial Revolution in terms of our genetic um, uh, inheritance is, is, has happened very, very suddenly and um, in evolutionary terms, our bodies can't adapt that quickly, our bodies take you know, hundreds of thousands of years to adapt to um, changes. So the Anthropocene human, the, 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 the modern human is, is really a new kind of human that's been about 10,000 years in the making. The, the 10,000 years is um, the agricultural revolution, which is the third up from the bottom there. That's, that represents 10,000 years. And that's really the time when we see lots of changes taking place. So what did our bodies used to be like? Well, we were, <laughs> we were slimmer. Um, uh, well, I was slimmer, but we're, you know, we were, as a species, we were a lot slimmer. Um, we were, um, initially we were taller, but then as soon as we started farming, we got a lot shorter. So our height has kind of responded to environmental changes. Our faces were different, our skulls were different. Um, our, our skulls were, were bigger, which means that the modern brain is actually smaller than it used to be because our diet has meant that our skulls don't um, develop in the way that they used to. So there's actually less space for our brains in there. Um, but one really, really clear, concise way of explaining just the scale of the changes that have taken place with the human body is um, if we look at bone density. And um, to go through these 
uh, very, very quickly. We have three examples here. We have a, um, a hunter-gatherer, a Mesolithic hunter, um, an agri early agriculturalist, a Neolithic farmer, and we have a modern worker. And bone density scans that have been done on different parts of the bodies, uh, like the humerus and the, and the, and the, and the hands, show that um, when we transitioned from hunter-gathering to um, uh, agriculture, our bone density dropped by, give or take, about 30%. And then when we transitioned from agriculture to uh, modern life, our bone density dropped by about 30%. So this means that when you compare modern humans to um, hunter-gathering groups, it means we have less than 50% of the bone density that they have. It means that we have less than 50% of the strength um, uh, that, that they have. So our bodies are unimaginably weaker. Now to give you a sense of what that you know, that those 30% mean. Um, a study done in 2017 that looked at the upper arm bones, the humerus of um, uh, agriculturalist women from, um, well, we now call it Germany, but, you know, Northern Eurasia. Uh, they found that the, the, the bone density um, of these agriculturalist women was greater than that of Olympic rowers. So that's what that 30% means. It, it doesn't sound like a lot, but it meant that these agriculturalist women from Northern Eurasia had bone density that was greater than Olympic rowers. So I think modern, what modern life is, one of the things that modern life has done is it's really warped our idea of what is normal for the, for the human body. I'll move very quickly through the rest of the slides now. Um, we used to move uh, a great deal. We used to move about five to nine miles every day. And now 41% of adults aged between 40 and 60 walk briskly for less than 10 minutes a month. Uh, in modern life, we have lost staggering amounts of movement. Um, and the challenges for the uh, future are really, it is really, um, uh, it's going to be a philosophical one because as modern humans, we are fundamentally technological thinkers, which means our internalized priorities are always going to be for efficiency. But in order for our bodies to, to, to uh, get more of what they need from our environments, we need to make sure that we introduce friction into our everyday lives. We need to make some things harder for us to do, um, but also to, to, for, for that friction to be somehow efficient. So the cities of the future will need to introduce um, uh, friction into our, into our lives. Um, and if it's to succeed, it's also going to need to be both um, efficient and productive. And again, I could talk about this for probably another hour. But the cities of the future will need to both require and encourage movement, not exercise, but movement, uh, physical activity. Exercise is a whole, is a whole big thing. Thing, uh, that I've got time to go into and both for our mental and for our physical health they're going to need to contain large amounts of green space so just to finish now um, what I'm interested in is finding things that have worked for the human body in the past um, that can inform our our stewardship of the modern body so that we can look at behaviors that have worked in the past for the human body and import them into modern life and I certainly don't advocate you know eating raw meat and drinking from from streams and what have you and I really like this this idea it's an old quote of um, John Roskins who was a 19th century art critic and social commentator um, and he said he was talking about old buildings and he said we have no right whatever to touch them they are not ours they belong partly to those who built them and partly to all the generations of my, mankind who are now to follow and I really like the idea of transforming this idea of of stewardship and conservation to the modern body, so that we can um, so that we can treat it better when it's well, so that we can push back uh, some of those early disability-adjusted life years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vaiba. That was uh, that was fascinating. Um, I think for now, if we can um, uh, put up uh, Roman um, uh, Krasnarek's uh, um, uh, video. Roman can't be with us uh, today, um, but uh, he's also um, 
as 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 Vibar is a, a prodigious author and thinker, um, and has prepared a video uh, today to explore another angle on the body um, uh, and an angle which explores the different ways, not how we're inhabiting uh, our bodies in, in, in today's society, but how might we inhabit um, the bodies of the future so that we might um, better shape um, a future in which we ourselves probably won't uh, be around uh, to experience. Um, so if we could get Roman's video up and um, uh, keep the questions coming on the Q&A and uh, we'll round, round them up and, and discuss them at the end. The future of ageing is often depicted as an intergenerational conflict. Why should young people today pay for the health care of an ageing population and be saddled by debt as a result? Or why should they respect the political views of older people when they can so clearly diverge from their own, as was the case over Brexit? But I think if we stand back and take the long view, looking beyond our own lifetimes, we can start to think about how we can create a better future for all future generations, be they young or old. And I'd like to explore this by delving into some ideas in my new book, The Good Ancestor, How to Think Long Term in a short-term world. And a starting point is to recognize and understand our relationship with the future. I believe we have colonized the future. In wealthy countries especially, we treat it like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely dump ecological degradation, like climate change and biodiversity loss and ocean acidification, and where we can dump technological risks, such as the risks from new technologies like artificial intelligence or perhaps the possibility of genetically engineered pandemics. And the tragedy of this situation is that future generations aren't here to do anything about it. They can't leap in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or stage a sit-in like a civil rights activist or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi. They're granted no political rights or representation. They have no influence in the marketplace. And it can be hard to grasp the scale of this injustice. So look at it this way. There are 7.7 .7 billion people alive today. But over the past 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But both of these are far outweighed by the nearly 7 trillion people who will be born over the next 50,000 years, assuming current birth rates level off and stabilize. In the next two centuries alone, tens of billions of people will be born. Amongst them, all your grandchildren and their grandchildren and the friends and communities on whom they will depend. The future is full of billions of people, both old and young. How will they remember us for what we did or didn't do when we had the chance? Now, someone who really thought about this issue was the immunologist Jonas Salk who developed the first polio vaccine in the 1950s. But in later life, he said, the great question facing our civilization is this, are we being good ancestors? In other words, how are we going to be remembered by all those generations to come? And he believed if we were going to be remembered well, we would need to expand our time horizons in order to tackle those big problems like our destruction of the living world. We'd have to learn to think not on a scale of seconds, minutes and hours, but on a scale of decades, centuries and millennia. But it's quite difficult to grasp that perspective of those future generations. How do we empathize with them? How do we step into their shoes? Now, this is something I've thought about, particularly because I founded a museum called the Empathy Museum, which is an international traveling art project. It goes around the world. It's about trying to step into the shoes of others. And one of our main exhibits is called A Mile in My Shoes. It's a gigantic shoe box and you can walk inside. It's the world's first empathy shoe shop. And someone will fit you with a pair of shoes belonging to a stranger when you go in there. Uh, it could be the shoes of someone who's been in prison for 14 years or a Brazilian sex worker or a Syrian refugee. And you can literally walk a mile in their shoes while listening to an audio narrative of them talking about their own life in their own words. You're completely embodied in who they are. But that's about empathizing, stepping into the shoes of other people in today's world across space. But how do we 
empathize through time? How do we step into the shoes of people who may not be born for decades or even centuries? We can't put on their shoes. We can't look them in the eye. We can't have a conversation with them. And that's something I explored yeah, in my book, The Good Ancestor. And one of th the things I think to start with, a beginning point for all of this, is to recognize that we do actually have a capacity for thinking long-term and connecting with those future generations. We what we really need to understand is something going on in our brains, that there is a struggle going on between what I call the marshmallow brain and the acorn brain. Now, the marshmallow brain is the part of our neuroanatomy which focuses on short-term rewards and instant gratification. It's named after the famous marshmallow test developed by psychologists in the 1960s where a marshmallow was put in front of kids and if they could resist eating it for 15 minutes, they were rewarded with a second marshmallow. And the result was the majority of kids couldn't resist the snack and gobbled it up. That's our short-term brain in action. There's lots of problems with the marshmallow test, but that was its general finding. And it's that marshmallow brain which drives us towards all those short-term things in life, like constantly clicking the, the buy now button and flicking on our phones. But alongside the marshmallow brain, we also have this, the acorn brain. This is the part of our neuroanatomy which focuses on long-term thinking and strategizing and planning. It's a new part of the brain. It's only a couple of million years old. And we've all got an acorn brain. But of course, some other animals do plan for the long term, but it's better developed in human beings than most other creatures. Sure, a chimpanzee might you know, get a stick, strip off the leaves and turn it into a tool to stick into a termite hole, but they'll never make a dozen of these tools and set them aside for next week. But that's precisely what a human being will do. We are experts at the temporal pirouette. Our minds can scan across time horizons. It's the acorn brain which enables us to save for our pensions or write song lists for our funerals. It's the acorn brain which has enabled us to build the Great Wall of China or the sewers of Victorian London or voyage into space. So the question is, we need to learn how to switch on this acorn brain and not just be consumed by the marshmallow brain. So how do we give space to the acorn brain? How do we switch it on? Well, there's lots of incredible projects around the world which engage with our acorn brain try and tap into our imaginative capacity to think long-term and connect with future generations. I wanna mention just one of them. So it's really practical and powerful. It's a movement in Japan called the Future Design Movement. It's inspired by the Native American idea of seventh generation decision-making, making decisions based on impact seven generations ahead, a kind of ecological stewardship in its origins. But the way future design works is it's a form of making local government decision, decisions originally. So future design invites local people to discuss and draw up plans for the towns and cities where they live. And they're typically divided into two groups. Half of them are told their residents from the present day. And the other half are given these ceremonial robes to wear and told to imagine themselves as residents from the year 2060. Well, it turns out the residents from 2060 systematically advocate far more transformative city plans, whether it's long-term healthcare investment or action on climate change or dealing with artificial intelligence or recovering from COVID-19. And the interesting thing about future design is that it's spreading from small towns like Yahaba to major cities like Kyoto. It's being used in Japan's Ministry of Finance and increasingly in companies too. And I think future design is something that could be used by local government and businesses around the UK and beyond. It could be used in community decision making. It could be used by schools all over the place. And one of the fascinating things about future design, it was originally actually designed to help Japanese towns and cities think about dealing with the dilemma of aging populations, a major issue in Japan, but it's been extended to cover a whole range of risks which are coming towards us in the 21st century. And the thing about future design is that whether the movement is working with younger people or older people, everybody, no matter their age, has this capacity to imagine the year 2050 or 2060 to think long term. It's not the monopoly of someone from any particular generation. We all have this imaginative capacity at different stages of our life cycle. So I think this is one of the ways that future design breaks down the barriers between young and old and it's had really concrete results. So in the town of Yahaba in Japan, 
using the future design method when originally the populace was opposed to increases in water taxes to do long-term investment in their water systems. Using future design, the whole town agreed and they passed this legislation to have a 6% increase in water taxes. So again, we see future design breaking down the barriers between generations because all future generations in that town, whether younger people or older people, are going to benefit from that better water system. So standing back, I think ultimately we need to think very long term about the prospects of humanity and recognize that we all face the same dilemmas, both young and old. We face technological risks from things like bioweapons or AI. And above all, we all face the same ecological risks. By the year 2100, if we continue with business as usual, our world will be three to four degrees hotter and our oceans and sea levels will be one to two meters higher. This is gonna have devastating effects on future generations. I mean, my daughter is 12 years old and in the year 2100, she could well be alive. She'll be in her early nineties. So, you know, even her grandchildren may be alive then and live well into the 22nd century. So if I care about my daughter's life and her grandchildren's and children's lives, I need to care about all life. I need to care about how we as a society can learn to live within the bio capacity, within the limits of the one planet we know that sustains life. If we can do that, we will become the good ancestors that future generations deserve and all future people, no matter their age, will benefit from it. Thank you very much, Roman, um, in absentia, of course. Um, and um, thank you all for your questions on uh, on the Q&A. It's, it's slightly unfair for Vibar to have to pick up some questions that, um, that might have been th uh, occasioned by what Roman just said. But since he ended with, with something on children, um, I wanted to just maybe pose uh, this question back back to you, Vibo, and I'm sure you'll be able to, to give us some thoughts on it, which was a question from Daniel uh, Scharf, which is, aren't children and grandchildren boundary objects within which both the present, uh, within both the present and the future? It might take our personal interests about 100 years into the future. That includes that time scale. So in other words, if we think through children and, and possibly grandchildren, we can bridge our present and, and project at least 100 years forward. What, what's your thoughts on, on that recipe for longer term thinking? Um, I, um, when, I, when I wrote the book, I very quickly realised that uh, I was always going to get asked about the future. So there's a, I, I, my book finishes with a chapter about the future. And like, yeah, from the very first talks I attended, people just said, what's, what's the future for human beings? And I had a glib answer, one of which was, well, if I knew that, I wouldn't be writing a book. I'd be making lots and lots of money from, from clever inventions. So I'm a historian. I'm not so, much, I'm not so uh, great about the future. For me, I think one of the ways in which we can address some of the things that are happening now to, to humans um, uh, and I'm thinking about the, uh, levels of, of like the amount of pain that there is in the world. Like, uh, uh, lower back pain is the is the number one cause of disability um, throughout the world. Um, it's, it's 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 prevalence has has never been known uh, throughout history as as being as, as 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 bad as it is today. And I think if we we were better educated about what was what really was normal for the human body, um, then we'd I don't know we'd just have more of a chance with our children. For for many of for many of us that are here today, um, uh, I mean it's never too late. There are always things that we can keep doing. Of course, we you know we can stay active and what have you. But um, uh, nobody here today is going to be able to correct their short sightedness, for example, and their short sightedness is something that's been ex uh, expressed by habits, behaviours, a tiny bit of genetics, about 20% of their genes, um, uh, when uh, between the ages of about four and, and 25. So there's, nobody's going to be able to, to, to wind back the clock and correct that. But they can correct levels of inactivity. They might not be able to correct the, the, 
core causes of back pain. But we can definitely help the next generation um, uh, to not have the same um, uh, the same problems or not to be uh, investing so deeply in the expression of these problems as as we as we have been by you know inventing like I'm sitting in now really comfortable ergonomic chairs that just encourages to sit for even longer so um, the child the, the child is, 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 is where there is, there is possibility for us to make real changes for the levels of healthcare that are needed to sustain um, the modern human body. Uh, so I think there's great potential there for the future. Great. Actually, you touch on something that, that, that's coming up quite a bit in the, in the chat, actually, which is, um, which is just this idea, I think you talked about kind of killing with kindness and maybe the, the incredibly comfortable chair is, is, a, is, a, is one uh, instance of killing with kindness. So I wonder if you could, 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 could sort of touch, you know, in the context of, of ageing societies, touch on the, the different ways in which we can kind of engineer an environment, because arguably you're your thesis is is essentially one of, of how the environment around us is 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 responsible for for, for transformations in our bodies. So, um, you know, in, in a world in which we're aging, but in in an in an age where you know perhaps we're not encouraged to develop mus muscle strength or or other things that will help us avoid frailty in later life, um, could you speak a bit to kind of how we can design um, more friction or less kindness, arguably into, into yeah. Um, so I think one of the one of the real the the, the unseen evils of of um, uh, technology and modernity. And don't get me wrong, you know I am fully techno technologyed up. Um, so I I really am a complete hypocrite. But one of the one of the things that technology does is um, it's it has been taxing us for generations. Um, technology has been taxing our movement for, for generations. And because uh, we tend to only have a single generational memory, when we look back at our own lives, we think, well, I moved around quite a bit when I was a kid, but I move a bit less now. And, and the, 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 the movement drop, it doesn't seem so, so great. I mean, obviously, you know, we have different energy levels when we're, when we're my age. I'm in my very early um, 50s, I'm 51. Um, but once we start to take a slightly longer view and start to think about a single uh, task that technology has been providing solutions for, um, I quite like using the example of a, of a rug. So if you go back to the 1920s and imagine the, um, the calorific expenditure um, of cleaning a rug. So you'd roll up the rug, you'd sling it on your shoulder, you'd go into your backyard, you'd put it over a line, and then you'd whack the bejesus out of it for 15 minutes until it stopped kind of just getting plumes of dust coming out of it. Then you'd take it back off the line, roll it back up, fling it back over your shoulder, um, put it back, and then put all the furniture back in space. Uh, put all the furniture back in place rather than not in space. Um, and then you would... That's, uh, so that's what, 200 calories? You'd burn 200 calories doing that. Now, once you cycle through a U-bank, I don't know if you remember, a U-bank, these really crap things that had uh, spinning brushes on them that used to pick up the dust, U-bank, and then the, like these vacuum cleaners that were built like tanks, you know, they would, it would still require work, but a few more technological steps, and you now can go like this on your phone, and you can activate your RoboVac. So you, you're now burning about 0.01 calories for something that used to require about 200 calories. And there are numerous examples of this. So we have been, um, we've just, there's just been astonishing amounts of movement has been taxed from us by technology. So we need to put some of it back. Um, I, normally, I normally don't sit in this chair, I've just moved house and uh, everything's in chaos. But uh, for business leaders, I think the office chair of the future is one that drawing pins slowly come out of the seat so that it is incredibly uncomfortable for the person to sit in them for more than 20 minutes. So I think the, find the worst chair that you can possibly find in your house and use that as your office chair because it will encourage movement. It will encourage you to break that um, those uh, uh, long spans of, 
of inactivity. And once we start looking around our house and we see washing machines and we see dishwashers, and it's very easy for us to then see all of the movement that has been taxed from us. And then the difficulty is trying to reintroduce some of that friction into our lives. And it is friction. It's quite, it's quite hard. So actually, that's a, a, a good, um, a good segue to, to, to another question, which is, which is one about how we trust our, our bodies. So you've talked a lot about, you know, the ways in which we've, we've designed environments that, that don't encourage our bodies to, to do very much, or at least give us a very good excuse for not doing um, that which we used to do. So what are the ways in which we could better trust our bodies to do the right thing to help us to age well? Oh, wow. OK. Um, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm, I'm really not sure of the answer to that. I think um, uh, better education about the stewardship of our bodies would be good. Um, something that moves beyond the idea of, you know, you need to be fit and you need to be um, healthy. Um, telling people that they have to exercise, you know, we've been doing that for on and off since the Greeks and that it hasn't, hasn't worked out really well. Instead, we need to have um, um, environments designed to, um, to encourage, no, not actually, no, encourage is even wrong. We need to have environments designed that predetermine movement. Yeah. Um, for 2 million years, you know, exercise did not exist. Exercise had to be invented by um, uh, Greek aristocrats who had slaves to do all their work for them. Exercise emerges as a, as a response to extreme social inequality. Yeah. Um, and, ex you know, this is a difficult thing to say because, of course, exercise is very good for you. And as soon as I finish here, I'm going to be climbing on an indoor bike and doing some exercise. But... Exercise, I think, is never going to work as a long-term solution for the for the human body while it's an additional thing that we have to trust people to do. Okay. It's much easier that people um, have an environment that predetermines movement and therefore um, uh, negates the need for any exercise whatsoever. I, I think that's a, a, a good point. And uh, you, something we were talking about, excuse the cat, um, Something we were talking about in the um, in the context uh, when we were speaking in the green room, as it were, before we started, was was how much harder I find it to run now that I don't live in London. Partly because I could run to the office in the morning, and uh, you know, exercises, as it were, inserted into the cracks of my life rather than bolted on at the end of, of end of a day. Um, and I think, you know, despite what you said as an academic, you always look on the on the negative side of things. I mean, there does seem to me to be a lot of initiatives, whether it's London or elsewhere, where walking is being designed back into the system. And there's huge efforts underway by uh, Transport for London and the mayor's office to encourage that sort of work, um, you know, in working out in, in within the context of our daily routines. And I'm quite certain there are many examples from from other areas um, of the country and, and more globally where walking is being designed back in. But um, it would seem to, to me, you know, consistent with what you're saying, which is that we need to think um, about how it can be designed in as a feature rather than bolted on as a, um, you know, as a shiny knob, as it were. Um, so it's, it's integral to the design of our world. Uh, absolutely. And then we wouldn't be uh, as overwhelmed as we are um, uh, paying for, you know, diabetes treatments and heart disease treatments. You know, the cost of these things is um, it's just it's staggering. You know, modern life is really it, it is really making us ill. Millions and millions and millions of people die of these diseases uh, every year. We used to die because um, we couldn't uh, eat enough and uh now we mostly die because we eat too much yeah yeah i was particularly struck it sounds by... like i'm making it like i'm, I'm saying it's a problem at, 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 at for individuals it's it's not at, at, at all it's the fact that modern life is 
serving as these technological solutions to, yeah. to irritating, um, time-consuming problems like washing your clothes. Yeah. Um, but it's not always great for us. Just because we like it doesn't mean it's good for us. <laughs> I mean, I think both these talks have sort of have, have played around really in really interesting ways with 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 time frames, right? So, um, you know, whether we're looking back, I read a, a book recently on on uh, on work, the uh, history of how we spend our time, and the author James Sussman makes this very interesting point that actually the biggest, probably the biggest shift in human history was the agricultural revolution because it completely changed the ways that we think about what time is, um, what, you know, the distinction between leisure and work essentially emerges from the agricultural revolution. So I think, you, you know, and, and you're, you're talking about the kind of the deep history of, of the body through um, from the past through, through to the present. And of course uh, now, uh, and then, you know, Roman, I think is, is looking at it um, into the, into the into the future um but it also strikes me that uh, there are many things against us when it comes to even the intellectual exercise of, of looking ahead so i'm sure many of the participants at this conference will uh be exposed to or work within or be thinking about the financial services sector and and one in in an aging world, one that uh, one hopes would be much more focused on the longer term than it is. So, I'm struck by a kind of a contradiction, if you will, between you know financial services products that uh, encourage us to think long term, but are very often sold by businesses which run on you know quarterly profits in other words they run at exactly the opposite kind of cadence to the one that we uh, are encouraged to take um, a, a view on ourselves as we invest or save in in these products so um, it feels like there are some very contradictory uh, tensions in the system where even the even the institutions that are focused on the long term are actually fundamentally results driven on a quarterly basis, um, which add further disincentive for us ourselves to think longer term. It is, it's, it's a real challenge. Um, um, yeah, introducing, um, um, like I said, you know, introducing friction, it creates friction in your life. It's, it's, a, it's a hard thing to do. Um, um, and it does create tension. I mean, one of the things that I did when, uh, well, I did two things actually, when I was researching the climate change, um, after nearly 30 years of driving, I got rid of my car. And um, I lived in London. And I think when you live in London, you you forget about the state of public transport outside London. Um, so it did make it much easier for me to, to, to get around without, without a car. Um, so I did that, but I also became a kind of, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is an Alan Partridge ism, um, but I also came, became a kind of nomadic writer. Um, by that I mean I would I would write in coffee shops mainly, and I would walk a couple of miles to a coffee shop, sit down to write for a bit, and then walk to another. You know, have some lunch, then walk to another, and it meant that it means that by the time I get to the, uh, the end of my writing day, an activity that would normally mean that I walked two meters to a desk and you know worked a keyboard and uh, strolled several miles with my fingers but not with my feet it just means that i i get to the end of that day having you know covered five or, or, or seven miles but it does i mean it takes it takes time as an academic i think i have a job that allows me to um put things into those pockets of time that for many people would be dead time so i can listen to you know audio books that i'm teaching or what have you but um at the moment it's it really is work to to um introduce more movement into your day yeah. and it'd be great to just come up with some solutions that made it much easier for people if you were um if you were king for the day you were world president for the day and you could you could wave a magic wand at Certainly all of those involved in the built environment, because I think so much of what you've kind of covered is is um, is about the built built environment to some extent or the environment writ large. You know, what would be your one your one policy or your one wish? This is this is such an easy question. The car. 
has been a disaster for human health. It's been a disaster, not only in terms of uh, pollution and pollution, you know, it's going to be helped when we go to um, uh, transition to electric cars, for example. But even then, um, you know, electric cars might be seen as a kind of blank check to, to, to use cars even more. And, you know, don't get me wrong, I, I really miss my car. I like being in my car. I like getting into it at the end of my working day and no one can get in and I can just do what I want and I don't have to answer phones or emails or anything. But an electric car, even if it was less polluting, it still just discourages movement at a staggering level. So, yeah, it would be the car. I would just laser all the cars out of existence and, and then I'd be the most unpopular king ever for a day. Yeah, well, you may be or you may not be. I suppose it depends on the time frames in which even that policy is judged, right? Um, and, um, you know, none of us want our shiny things taken away uh, that much in our own lifetimes. But um, maybe maybe the the answer to the conundrum about how we design for the future is... is um, is take these things away that, so that uh, future generations won't won't have them um, at all. So maybe if you were to to remove the car, um, uh, there'll be no trace of it. I, I read uh, Robert Harris's second second sleep this this year. It's oh, paints yeah. a picture of a world. It, it, it's befitting this theme, I think. But you know, he paints a picture of a world several hundred years. Uh, ahead in which all traces of technological innovation have um, have, have have been buried by a, a theocratic um, state and um, and in a sense no one knows uh, what they're missing you know, um, even if it, it turns out it's even possible to live without an iPhone um, if you've never if you've never owned one um, so um, so maybe that is the um, you know, maybe maybe the design principle for the world of the future that we want to bequeath uh, our of our, 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 um, our, our future uh, ancestors is 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 one in which they they won't miss the things that they never had. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't know how much time we've got left. Maybe somebody on the system could uh, could let me know. But no more time. Okay. Well, I'm sure you've all got um, either um, probably not Christmas parties, but maybe um, other Zoom parties to attend. Um, on behalf of everyone at ILC, I mean, I think somebody's going to be doing some wrapping up, but um, I certainly want to extend my uh, uh, thanks to, to Vibar um, for his thoughts. Um, do buy his book, apparently best bought in pairs at Christmas. Um, so that's Primate Change. Um, and uh, Roman, um, who obviously couldn't be with us and has a book that he would also like you to buy um, at Christmas. And it would be um, bereft of me not to say that I have a book that I'd also like you to buy. But um, since Vibar and Roman have been the stars of this show, buy their book now. Um, so thanks very much for attending. Thank you, everyone.